If you've got a Bible with you, go with me to the book of Romans, and we are going to be in Romans 8 once again. If you uh, do not have a Bible with you, but you'd like to follow along with us, there should be a Bible in one of the chair racks there in front of you, and if you're kind of new to the whole Bible thing and don't know where to find stuff, it can be tricky. Uh, So the Bibles that are in the chair racks there, you can find Romans 8 on page 944 of those Bibles. I'll remind you of something briefly uh, that uh, I reminded the first service of this morning, and that is we were going to go to the book of Genesis and in God's providence decided to move Genesis into the beginning of next year because there's not enough Sundays left to uh, get a good head start on that without having to take a break. And so um, we are actually going to do the book of Ezra next. There are 10 chapters in Ezra. And we're going to cover two chapters at a time, roughly, so we're going to cover Ezra in uh, about five uh, weeks. And I asked the first service, and I'll ask you, has anyone here heard a sermon series through Ezra? Nobody. Well, you've got something in common with the first service, because nobody had there either. And I just think it's such a tragedy um, that we have not heard more preaching from the Old Testament. Uh, A lot of the Bible is the Old Testament. And it matters, <laughs> and that's why, uh, that's why we try to go to the Old Testament a lot. It's rich um, with, with information about God, about His plan. It has great application for our lives um, when you read it with an eye for that. And so, very excited to get to Ezra with you next. Okay, if you're in Romans 8, if you want to be in Romans 8, you're probably there by now. If you've noticed, uh, as we've been going through this series through Romans 8, 28 through 30, you've probably noticed that the Bible makes a pretty bold promise in these verses. In fact, this promise is so bold, it is so brazen, it is so audacious that you would not dare make that promise unless that promise could be backed up. That promise is a statement that many followers of Jesus have counted on to get them through some of the darkest nights of their souls. That statement is this, found in Romans 8 and verse 28. The Bible says in those verse, that, that verse, we know, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. I want you to consider all the life experiences, all the circumstances, all the things that fit under the category, all things. Or to ask that question a different way, what wouldn't fit under the category, all things. There are all kinds of things where we can easily see the good. There are all kinds of circumstances where we can imagine a path to good from those difficulties. And there are circumstances in our own lives where we can see that if we didn't get that thing that we really wanted, we wouldn't have gotten this thing. So, for example, you got fired from your job. But if you'd never gotten fired from your job, you find out several years later, you never would have found this job and all the growth opportunities that it's had for you. And so you can see how God took something 
difficult and used it for good. Or you get dumped. And your heart is broken. And you think, I'll never find anyone that will love me or I could love again. But eventually you find that person and you think, man, if I got stuck in that relationship with that person I'd wanted so much, I never would have found this person. And I can see how God is working all of that stuff for good. So this verse can sometimes be kind of lobbed out as a, hey, you know, it's, everything's going to work out. When God, doesn't open, when God closes a door, he opens a window. <laughs> that isn't in the Bible, by the way. If it was anywhere, it'd probably be in Proverbs. <laughs> but it, it doesn't happen to be in there. Most of us, though, have things in our lives where we can't even see why God would allow it, much less use it for good. See, when you've got something in your life where, where you don't even see why God could even let that happen, much less fulfill this bold, audacious, brazen promise, you know, that makes the whole, when God closes the door, he opens a window, like that throws that kind of thinking out in these kinds of situations. So sometimes when we experience those kinds of things where I can't see the path to good, this thing that's happened in my life, there is no conceivable outcome that's better than what I already have. Because there's stuff in our lives like that, right? There's stuff in our lives where I don't care, I don't care what the good is, it's not better than what I've got that's being taken. So that might cause us to go back to the verse and look and see if there is an asterisk Surely, there are exceptions to this broad category of all things. But there aren't. There is no asterisk there. The Bible gives us this promise of all things for good in the context of deep suffering. This promise is intended not for the, I lost the promotion, but I'll get a better job later sorts of situations. That certainly applies to that. This promise is intended for those dark nights of the soul where there does not seem to be a path to good, where we can't imagine how this could possibly be used for good. And we know that because of previous verses. If you're there in Romans 8, look at verses 22 and 23. It'll be on the screen behind me. But in there, the Bible says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, Grown inwardly as we await eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So there's all kinds of things that could be said about this verse, but one of, the, one of the things that it says is not only the creation, not just people outside, but we ourselves, people who have the Spirit, people who have been reborn, people who have been renewed, people who, who, who have the life of Christ in us now, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit are at one and the same time experiencing that Spirit life, but also groaning inwardly while we wait for something. Because we don't yet fully have what's been promised. 
And so while we have experienced many good things, now we're, we're still waiting for the redemption. We're still waiting for more. Part of the problem for us in this time frame of all, uh, uh, part of the problem for us is the time frame for God working all things together for good. Because I don't know about you, but I want things to work out together for good now. I mean, don't you? Is there anybody who's like, I'd like to delay good as long as I can. No, we want things to work out for good right now, or at least in the near future. I want the Joseph, I want the Joseph experience, but in the space of about three days. Glad that's over. And there are times, as I've said, when we can't see the path to good. And let's be honest. There are some losses that aren't going to be recovered this side of paradise. That's true. God's promise to us in this is is not that everything will be resolved for good in this life, because those verses we said, we just read, said that we're awaiting for this full redemption. Now, the Bible gives us all kinds of comfort and encouragement to help us with the difficulties and the pain and the loss of this life. It promises the possibility that we can have a measure of joy and a measure of peace and a measure of hope, even in the midst of these great difficulties. But what the verses that we've been looking at do is promise us that in spite of the difficulties that you may experience and despite some of the profound losses that you are going to experience in life, losses, I might add, that can't be undone, you are going to make it from foreknown to Glorified. Gonna make it. Nothing is gonna derail that train. That's what it says in these verses we've been looking at. You've been suffering, you're groaning inwardly as you experience the hurt and the pain of living in this broken world, but all things work together for good. Here's why. Verse 29, for those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. We saw three weeks ago that glorification is the end of the line. God's foreknowing of us in eternity past, before any of this world was created, his, his decision to know us and set his love upon us is most assuredly going to end in this amazing, eternal experience of glory. It's going to happen. And that experience of glory we saw a few weeks ago is going to to be so significant that the Bible actually can say that the difficulties of this life could be considered in light of those glories, light and momentary afflictions. Let me be careful to say again, the Bible's not saying, giving us a platitude of closing a door, opening a window with this. The Bible is not saying that the most difficult experiences of your life, the most profound losses of your life are light. That's not what the Bible is saying. 
What the Bible is saying that we must receive by faith is that there is coming a day when our experience of glory will render us to view those things in a completely new light. It's not until then that we will say, ah, I wondered what that felt like. The only way that God is good, can make good on that guarantee of all things for good is if he is in total control of your eternal destiny from beginning to end. And that's exactly what these verses and these links and these golden chain show us. If you are A Christian here this morning, you have been foreknown, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. You are bound to Christ with this golden chain. So having established that confidence, I hope, I want to ask you four questions that this text asks. These questions are, are intended to draw out for us implications. If what the Bible says in this bold, audacious, brazen promise is true, if that's true, then answer these four questions. So let's start with the first one. If it's true that God does indeed work all things together for good, The number one, who can be against you? Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then should we say to these things? I mean, this is the Apostle Paul who wrote this is saying, okay, if all the stuff that I said is true, and it is, what then should we say? What are the implications? How should I think? Well, first question, well, if God is for us, who can be against us? Now, let's get the obvious thing out of the way. There's a lot of people against us, aren't there, at times? I have a friend who became a Christian and a follower of Jesus, and when that happened, his wife hated him for it. She did everything she could to frustrate him to work against the way he wanted to go in his following of Jesus. And their marriage eventually ended in divorce. And Jesus said stuff like that would happen. He said, I've come to turn fathers against their children and children against their fathers. He wasn't saying, my goal in coming is to make sure I create family conflict. What he's saying is that when I come and people follow me, there's going to be conflict And it's going to be some deep rifts. You think our brothers and sisters in other places in the world, like Afghanistan, for instance, might say that there are some people who are standing against them? I think they would. And those are just some more extreme examples. Examples could be multiplied, both great and small, of people who are in some way standing against us. In fact, as I talk about this, you may be thinking about a particular conflict that you have with a particular person in your life, some sort of ongoing, drawn-out conflict that's keeping you, you feel, from what God has for you. If only that person wasn't against me, I could flourish, right? I'd be a lot more on track if I wasn't constantly running into this person. This verse isn't telling us that we won't experience opposition as followers of Jesus. What it is telling us is that no one will ultimately be able to successfully thwart your destiny. You are going to become what God intends for you to be. There is no one and nothing 
can stand in the way of that purpose. God's end game for you is the experience of glory. So you think about the people in your life that are making it not glorious. People who exert some measure of control over you. The people who hold the keys to your reactions, your emotions. The people who have hobbled you from the past. The people who exert some level of, uh, cause you to be in some level of fear over them because of them. And then we hear verses like Psalm 118, 6 and 7, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. Well, that's just Psalms talking Romans talk. If God is for us, who's going to be against us? There's a second question. If God does indeed work all things for good, then what wouldn't God give you? What wouldn't God give you? Now, this is a toughie. So let's think a little bit about it. Romans chapter 8 and verse 32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Now, you ought to struggle with that verse, or you're not reading it. Because one of the things that makes us question whether God is really working all things for good is the perception that God is sometimes withholding good from us. Have you ever prayed for something that you didn't get? Have you ever pleaded with God not to take this and it's gone. Well, that's the kind of stuff that makes us ask. Are you withholding good from me? There are things that we either desperately want or things that we think we desperately need that God sometimes doesn't provide and that sometimes makes us question God. God. The Bible doesn't lay out an explanation for every single circumstance that you, in which you have felt that way, as if we could answer all of them to our satisfaction. But the Bible does ask us a question. We're, we're asking that question. The Bible asks us a question in the verse we just read. If God gave his own son to bear your sin your shame, and your guilt on the cross. If God was able to experience the whatever relational turbulence it means when Jesus says, why have you forsaken me? If God's willing to give his son for that, then what's left after? Jeff Bezos, the Amazon guy, is the richest person in the world right now. And the statistics for how wealthy he is are, are just incomprehensible. He makes $3,715 a second. He makes $325 million a day. He makes $2.25 billion a week. 
He makes $8.99 billion a month. He's doing better than you. <laughs> People who do this sort of thing have calculated what would it take for him to get rid of all this money if he was to not earn another penny in any way, shape, or form. If, if Jeff Bezos was to give away a million dollars a day without earning any more money in his life, it would, he would have to live six centuries to do it. That's a lot of money. More money than I got. Now imagine you have the good fortune of becoming the close personal friend of Jeff Bezos. And he says, you know, I want to do something nice for you. I'm going to fly on a private jet, a hundred of you and your closest friends and family to a private island. You can stay at one of my mansions. I'll pay for the whole thing for the week. It's on me. You're in. <laughs> and he says to you, if you need anything while you're there, just call me. So you get there, you're on this lavish thing that he, your friend Jeff is paying for. And you realize we're out of paper plates, and you're sitting there like, ugh, should I call them? Well, in the time you thought about calling him, he just made a million dollars. See, it would be crazy if this man with all this wealth, who's already done all this for you, you're agonizing over whether you should ask for 100 extra paper plates. That would be crazy. But the argument that the Bible is making here is even greater than that. You see... Jeff Bezos could be your friend and he could do that really nice thing for you where he spends millions of dollars for you to do this. But you know what? He makes so much money, he doesn't even feel that. God the Father, on the other hand, has given to you his most precious relationship so that you could be in relationship with him. And so the Bible asks us the question again. If he wouldn't spare his son, if he existing in perfect relationship, perfect relationship of the Trinity for all eternity, if, if he would then allow his son to take on flesh and die so the son cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If he would do that for you, then what wouldn't he give you that you need? Which means that when we don't get what we want or even what we think we need, it isn't an indication that God is stingy because he's already given you the greatest. It isn't an indication that he isn't listening. He was thinking about you before you existed. It doesn't mean that he doesn't have your best interests in mind. He's got this plan of glory laid out for you. And he's told us, Jesus himself told us, that we need to go to God for what we need. He says in Matthew 7, 11, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So when, we, the, when the Bible asks the question, what wouldn't God give you? The answer is that he will never keep anything good from you that you need. Which means that even in the most profound losses. He always has your best interest in mind. If he withholds or allows, it always ends in good. But he doesn't tell you how all the time. And so as God's people experiencing profound loss, experiencing heart-wrenching sadness, experiencing the difficulties of living in this broken world, 
as God's people, we have to come to verses like this and say, okay, I see the sun part. I don't get the rest. You, I, will, I can't be convinced right now that this, is, this can end in good. But I trust you. If you gave me your son, then you're going to give me what I need. And that's difficult because what it does is it makes us exercise faith without an explanation. I'm not into that. I'm into the explanation. You tell me how. And I'll believe it when you've told me. And God says, I've given you what's most precious. Trust me. There's a third question The Bible asks here, if it is true that God works all things for good, number three, then who could condemn you? Romans 8, verses 33 to 34. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect, God's chosen people? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Well, Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that, who was raised, and more than that, who is at the right hand of God, who, is, who indeed is interceding for us. We spent a good amount of time talking about this when we were talking about the fourth link in the golden chain of justification, so we won't spend a lot of time on this verse. But one of the reasons... We suspect that all things might not work for good is because we sometimes believe the lie that God is actually against us. What's one of the first questions we ask when stuff goes wrong? What did I do? Right? That's, that's the question we almost always ask. When everything's going wrong in life, what, what did I do? What did I do is the question, why are you against me, God? Because I need this, and you've done this. It talks to us about our heart's posture toward our Heavenly Father. There's a book called The Gospel-Centered Life in which the authors pose this question that I want you to think about for a moment. The question is this, as God thinks of you right now, what is the look on his face? God doesn't have a face, he's a spirit, get it. As God thinks of you right now, what's the look on his face? Think about it. They go and ask, do you picture God as disappointed, angry, indifferent? Does his face say, get your act together? Or, if only you could do a little more for me. I'll tell you mine. You don't have to tell me yours. Oftentimes when I think, what is God's face towards me? It's, it's disappointment. I know God loves me. But it's hard for me to escape sometimes the feeling that God is just like, man, I love you, but really? How old are you? What are you doing? You ever felt that way? Or or some of us can't shake the fact that God must be angry with us. Or we can't shake the fact that God is indifferent towards us because if he was a little more attentive, this wouldn't be happening. The 
they go on to say this in that book. If you imagined God as anything but satisfied because of what Jesus has done for you, you have fallen into a performance mindset. That's hard to believe, isn't it? It's hard for me to believe that. I want to perform a little bit. God, as we experience condemning thoughts, God is careful to point out, you may be experienced thoughts of condemnation, Christian, but I'm bringing no charges against you. The opening of Romans chapter 8 is the bold statement, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus Why would God condemn us now when his whole purpose for us from the very beginning has been to acquit us and at his own expense? You got to see, I got to see how I fit into the plan. Because when I'm feeling the condemnation of God, I'm forgetting, wait a minute, this whole thing started way before I existed or anything else existed. God's plan has been to acquit me this whole time. So why would God then turn around and say, man, you're lousy? God, your Father, brings no charge against you. His justice has been fully meted out at Christ. You are clothed with the righteousness of His Son. Your father loves you. He does not condemn you. What about charges from any other sources? I was reading in the news recently about a detective in New York City who they've just discovered he's been a a cop for 20 years, high-ranking guy, high-performing guy. And they found out that for who knows how long he's been fabricating his testimony against people and being used as star witnesses to uh, as a star witness to put all lock all kinds of people up and they're already looking at 90 convictions that are going to get overturned because he's just lying. They don't even know how many cases this guy has touched or how long he's been doing it. What if something like that could happen to us? What about the condemnation of our old enemy Satan? Remember what Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10 calls him, it calls him the accuser. And how often is he on the clock doing that job? What does the verse say? Day and night. It's not an occasional thing. He's our accuser day and night. The Bible asks, yeah, but who could condemn you? When Jesus Christ is your attorney and the perfectly just God is your judge, no charge against you will ever stick. So live your life like a person who has been given the verdict of not guilty. A person who is loved by their father. There's a fourth question and a final question that we want to ask this morning. If it's true, God is working all things together for good. Number four, who could separate you? Who could separate you from the Father who loves you? Romans chapter 8, look at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, 
nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth. Are we getting the idea? Nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our passage, Romans 8, 28, tells us that all things work together for good for those who love God. I wish that was worded a different way. I would rather it say, all things work together for good to those whom God loves. And the reason I would like it to be worded that way is because my love for God is not that great at times. There's a song we sing, He Will Hold Me Fast. Remember one of those lines? Though our love is often cold. Man, I wish it was just a bright, hot furnace of affection for God all the time. And that drove me every day from the moment I got up to the moment I laid my head on the pillow. But if the truth be known, that fire goes out pretty fast. So now what do we do? He's, he works out all things together for good for those who love him, but what happens if I'm not good at that? Here we've got to remember the important truth that we studied when we were in the book of 1 John, in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19. We love because he first loved us. And Romans 8 bears the context of that out. Our love is a response to his love. His working all things for good is not a response to our love, and his promise to do so is not contingent upon or dependent upon the strength of our love. Thank God he doesn't love like us. I mean, think about how, how badly you treat the people closest to you. That's how she wants to do this? Okay. Play the cold shoulder game. See how long it takes her to notice and ask me. I mean, we do that to each other all the time. God doesn't do that for us. And that means that nothing and no one can separate us from his love or his good intentions for us. I have a friend whose parents were divorced very, when he was very young. His sister was given to his mother, and his father told him his whole life that his mother didn't love him. She loved his sister more than she loved him, which is why he'd taken her sister. But the reason his mother had no contact with him is because she didn't care. And this friend made it into adulthood before he realized that all of it had been a lie the whole time. His mother had sent him letters that had been hidden from him. It was a lie of how he had been separated from his sister. His father had driven a wedge between him and his mother who loved him. And that stuff happens to us in life, doesn't it? Sometimes through no fault of our own, through circumstances that are outside of our control, there's a wedge gets placed between us and others. His father had separated him from his mother's love. But the Bible assures us in this passage that nothing will ever drive a wedge between you and your heavenly father's love. Verse 35 tells us how strong God's bonds of love are around us. 
The Bible doesn't promise us that we aren't going to go through life without suffering. The Bible doesn't promise that we won't experience tribulation. The Bible doesn't promise that we won't experience distress. The Bible doesn't promise that we won't experience persecution. The Bible doesn't promise that we won't experience the, uh, uh, being destitute. The Bible doesn't promise that we won't experience danger. The Bible doesn't promise that we won't experience the sword or death. We may well experience any one or combination of those things. What the Bible does promise, based on these verses, is that love always wins. That God has chosen to set his love upon his people, and there is nothing that can drive a wedge between us. So if any of the, in fact, any of those things do happen, we must not draw the mistaken conclusion that any of those things will ultimately defeat God's purposes for us. What the Bible actually tells us is that weak not very good at loving, broken, hurting, sinning, ashamed, depressed, anxious, fearful people like us are not just conquerors, but more than conquerors. How could people like us be more than conquerors. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. We aren't going to win by a Hail Mary at the end. We're not going to win by a buzzer beater. We win by a landslide. We've already won. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. God didn't fall in love with you, and he's not going to fall out of love with you. We love him because we were called. God, God called us because he loves. God's love is an initiation. Our love is the response. And nothing can separate us from that love. Let me speak to somebody who may be here with us this morning and you are not a Christian or you don't know what it means to be a Christian. Maybe you're hearing some of this stuff and you're thinking, wow, <laughs> it's heavy stuff. And it is, but life is heavy. I mean, we need more than just eight tips to succeed at work. Like, that's great. But you don't need me for that. Get a Kindle. Read a book about it. What are you going to do with the profound losses of life? What are you going to do with the pro profound disappointments of life? What's going to fix that stuff? I mean, our appeal to you as, as Christian people speaking to you and me speaking on behalf of this church is that you would find the kind of love that the Bible holds out as possible. For you to realize that there is a redemption that can happen where you could have your sins washed clean. That you could have the hope held out in front of you that all the broken things of your life are eventually going to be redeemed. That, that you might not be able to believe it right now, the difficulties of this life might be a, considered one day a light momentary affliction. So you might be asking the question, great, what do I got to do? And here's the even better answer, really nothing. There is nothing you can do to earn this. The Bible tells that this kind of salvation, this kind of redemption is a free gift offered by Christ to all who repent of their sins and put their trust in him. Will you believe? For those of us who are 
Christians here this morning. As we wrap up this little series in Romans 8, if God works all things for your good, who can be against you? Nobody. If God works all things for your good, what wouldn't God give you? He will supply what you need. If God works all things for good, who could condemn you? Your father certainly isn't. And if your father isn't, why would you? If God works all things together for good, who could separate you from his love? The golden chain is not an intellectual exercise. If we walk out of here after hearing the, the, the word presented week in and week out and we think, I wrote the definition to foreknown in my Bible, I've got it now. That's good. If you didn't know what it was and you wrote the definition down, that's good. If you can define all the links in this broken chain and say, here's how I could prove that all of these things are, the, are, what, are what we say they are, if, if, that's the, if that's the as far as it goes, you're missing the point. God isn't just giving us theological words and theological categories so that we can, can know them and write an essay about them or write answers on a test about him. Those things are being given to us. This golden chain is being given to us so that we could be assured of God's love. He wants you to know it and feel it. And you can. Because we are bound to him by a golden chain that will never be. So let's ask God to give us faith, trust. Lord, our, I guess, simple request that we're asking is, is that if a lot of this sounds unbelievable. It's pretty hard to believe. It's hard for us to slot in certain things under that all things. It's hard for me to do that. So I pray that you would give us a, a trust in you, that your word would inform us, and that you would supply the faith that we don't have. If there's somebody here this morning who does not know you as a loving Heavenly Father, I pray that you would work faith in their hearts so that they believe. They experience the joy of sins forgiven. The hope of a self and a world redeemed. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.